Welcome to the realm of magic and mystery, classic horror and sci-fi. You are now entering the House of the Unusual podcast with your hosts, Eddie and Joe. Welcome all you cool ghouls and friendly fiends. It's the House of the Unusual podcast. You all know me. I'm Joe Pavlansky. With me, as always, is Eddie Guevara. And today we have on us, have with us, Jason, the karate expert, Blakey. What's up, gentlemen? Hey, Joe. Uh, hello, guys. How's everybody? Good? Hey, good, good. All right, all right. Very good, very good. All right, we got a ton of stuff to talk about today. But first, I want to give a huge shout out to everybody over at Scary Monsters. So they have the results of the Rondo Awards for 2023, which is for all the work done in 2022, of course. And so, hmm, let's see. I'm just going to read this little email that they they sent me here for the, uh, the Rondos, but it has to specifically do with Scary Monsters winners. So there is more than uh, 5,250 votes uh making it the second largest turnout for this year's uh, voting for the Rondo Hatton Awards. And just real quick with the Rondo Hatton Awards, it goes through, well, kind of, it's a big thing over at uh, the Classic Horror Film Board. And it's it's been ran for years. You know, this is the, what did I say? This is the 22nd, right? Yeah. 22nd? 21st. 21 years they've been doing it. So it's a real big thing in the classic horror industry that, you know, to obtain one of these awards. It's it's all your peers are voting. Oh, Eddie, I hear some beeping. Are you in the elevator? It's 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 it's. <laughs> yep, it's uh, I'm getting to the elevator there, you know, Eddie's stuck in a spaceship. <laughs> so anyway, so, yeah, they it's it's all your peers that are voting for you. So it's 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 very important because it's not just some you know, some critic or, you know, somebody that's paid off by somebody else. These are all, all people who enjoy this uh, little niche of entertainment. So I'm just going to read some of the, uh, the winners and some of the runners up that scary monsters and castle of Frankenstein have obtained this year. So once again, and I think this is, yeah, six years in a row. Best magazine for the classic Scary Monsters won again. So, best classic uh, horror magazine, Scary Monsters, six years in a row. Yeah. Congratulations to them. Also, under the best article category, second runner up is The House of Seven Gables by Rob Laby, which appeared in Scary Monsters number 128. Honorable mention was Jack Kerak does far. Farah La Farah Lee by George, well, I'm going to butcher this, Hemenick from Castle of Frankenstein, issue number 36. All right, they also obtained Best Interview. There was an honorable mention for uh, Sandra Nemi, Vampire's Niece by Don Smiraldi, which appeared in Scary Monsters number 128. Best Column, second runner-up, Kaiju Corner by Mike Bogue which appears in every issue of Scary Monsters. Best cover, Scott Jackson won again, Scary Monsters number 128. I think he's won pretty much every year he's been in there. His his artwork's fantastic. All right, writers, Writer of the Year. First runner-up is Rob Laby, and fourth runner-up is George Humanick. Artist of the Year, fourth runner-up is Scott Jackson, and longtime contributor and author and, you know, just an all-around classic horror sci-fi historian, Monster Kid Hall of Fame inductee Frank Delestrito. So huge congratulations to everybody on there and all the people at Scary Monsters for six years in a row, best classic magazine. So definitely very cool. And also, if you were like, hey, what the heck, Scary Monsters? You know, I've never heard of them again. And, you know, you just stepped off that Martian spaceship, you know, because you don't know anything about them. Head over to mymoviemonsters.com. 
You'll find all their back issues, the new issues. Um, the New Castle of Frankenstein, which is, uh, let's see here, number 37, is out at stores. I just picked mine up at Barnes & Noble's last week. It's a fantastic issue. A lot to do with uh, George Powell's Lost Time Machine sequel and revisiting a legendary film produced 100 years ago. So you don't want to miss that one out. Uh, let's see what else they got. I think the new, yeah, issue number, Scary Monsters, issue number 131 is available for pre-order. So make sure you jump on that now. Issue number 130 should already be at your bookstore and they are shipping from their website. MyMovieMonsters.com. Make sure you check that out. And a huge thank you to all the people at the Classic Horror Film Board that put the uh, the rondos together because it's it's a ton of work and it's you know just a handful of people that make it happen every year and they keep it going and going with their own time and, and money so huge thank you to all them all right as for that you know i'm going to turn it over to jason blakey and see what's new with him and he, i tell you what guys everyone out there in podcast land head over to the house of the unusual.com in the forum check out our our different topics on there because Jason's been posting some really cool old school karate pamphlets with some great artwork on the cover and on the inside. And if you need to protect yourself, this might not be the place to, <laughs> to try to do it at, but Hey, it, it could be a good start and uh, some good reading. So Jason, take it away, brother. Oh man. Um, what I've been, I've been, um, past couple of weeks, I've been tracking down some records. There was, I guess it was the seventies and uh, records were a big thing and there were a few uh martial arts records that came out in that period that were advertised in comic books and magazines and oh wow there's about as few of those available as as the books themselves um which is surprising because you think people would keep records longer but they're pretty rare um i managed to track down one guy in oregon i think he uh he had posted the internet is great for this stuff. Um, in 2012, he wrote a blog post about his record, his karate record that he had. And I ran across the advertisement for it, the the Demura karate record. And I found his post. And so I did a little bit of poking on the internet and I tracked him down to, a, I think, a university or a college in Oregon and tracked down his email. And unlike most people, that I tracked down who don't respond whatsoever, he was happy to, to make a deal. So I'll be able to, I, I'm sure he paid $2 or something for it at a yard sale. So <laughs> I'm paying a bit more than that, but I'm happy. I'm happy to get it. It's the only one I've seen that's a, an available copy. So, so have you ever heard any of the records before? No, Do you know what's no, on I, them? Have, I have no idea. I have no idea. They're not on, on YouTube. Nobody's, nobody's uh, recorded them and posted them or shared them. I wonder if, I mean, I wonder how you, you teach martial arts from a record or maybe it's music that you listen to while you're, you know, you're in your living room training. No, I can imagine it's one, two, one, two. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, I'm, I'm starting to realize that the purpose of this whole genre of, of stuff was not in any way, shape or form to teach martial arts in, in, in the, unless it was the most slight slightest amount of 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 teaching because i mean the martial arts are you can get down to the core of them they're pretty simple in what they teach you to do karate use your use your core strength for your punches i mean it's, it kicks and stuff like that. use your hips and aikido is unbalance your opponent and judo is take the person's center and none of these books mention any of that at all like i would call that the core the core for different martial arts is not it's not rocket science for this stuff this is basically there to to sell a product i mean yeah you know looking at it more recently in the last couple of decades you had um paladin press yep which was mostly ran through soldier of fortune magazine and they had the same thing but it yep. was just updated for modern generation and they were put in yep. books and it was just all this this bull crap type martial arts stuff and it was there to just sell a product basically yeah, I saw a, um, somebody had posted an article about Soldier of Fortune. I think it was in, I forget where I came across it. I'll have to track it down. Uh, but he called the people who liked reading that kind of stuff bloody romantics. And he said the, in the article, he, had, he was saying you know, bloody romantics have been around forever. 
And I guess this is just another um, attempt to sell to that market of, of the, uh, the armchair uh, romantic, I uh, bloody romantic, I guess the armchair fighter. Yeah, I mean, I, I could definitely see that. You know, I started reading Soldier of Fortune when I was in high school. Yep. yep. When I was probably, gosh, 14 years old or so. And I had always been, you know, big into the military at, from a young age, which I could credit that to G.I. Joe, a real American hero, the cartoon, you know, and then the toys and all that really had me interested in the movies. Well, I'm sorry, in that, in, in the military then when desert storm hit and everything mm -hmm. else but rolling into high school you know it was like okay what's the next thing that i could be involved with with the military oh here's soldier of fortune or you know whatever gun magazine yep but yeah it was really cool because i couldn't do that stuff i was waiting to graduate to go into the military so I'm, you know i get to read about all this stuff going on mm -hmm. all over the world and yeah i could definitely see that for people that are you know, like that, that want to read about it and kind of almost get an adrenaline rush. Yeah, it's, 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 it seems it's a lot like, I mean, the entire mail order industry of selling the dream, I guess. You're selling the dream. Well, um, yeah, basically what it is, you look at it, and I'm sure Eddie could attest this, you look at any yeah. product and you, you know, you're like, say, even the seven foot ghost, you know, you're, you're, <laughs> you're looking at it and you're like, man, all this stuff that could happen that you could do with it and then you get it and you're like, well, I, I can't do nothing with it, <laughs> but you know, you're, you're living that you're fulfilling that dream, but yep. in the end you ultimate, and it's almost like a drug because you're, you're, you're fulfilling that dream and it's the high comes down and you want that high again. Um, you know, kind of like how social media is right now where, you know, you're waiting for the clicks, you're waiting for the likes. Well, with mail order, you're you're waiting for it. You're waiting for the new thing. You're waiting for it to come in, and your high is is at a high. And yeah, comes that anticipation. In and you're, yeah. yeah, you're disappointed that high goes down. So it's almost like you you need to you fix know, again. You so, another hit. Yeah, thanks, Eddie. You're you're a mail order drug dealer. <laughs> <laughs> the first ghost is free. Yeah, you know, first yeah, ghost is free, man. <laughs> definitely. You know what I wanted to bring up to the table is uh, jo Jason. I wish I knew. You were originally looking for that because, believe it or not, I happen to have, I think, about three albums of those karate courses. <laughs> Why would I not believe it? I, I definitely. I, I, really. them, I, I actually came across. I need to see which one they are, but I believe the one. One of them has a guy kicking. He says karate on it, and I think it's like a two uh, record spread. Yeah, I did buy them. I I have no idea. I never heard them. I don't know what's on them, but I know I do have them. <laughs> Let me check my online database here. It's two hours of punch, punch, kick, punch, <laughs> punch, kick. Yeah, all you hear is you just go listen to the sound. Two, 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 two. Yeah, yeah. I hope you got that in your brain. Practice it every day. <laughs> uh, listen, uh, to be honest, Jason, I yep. anytime you're going to be looking for anything, just you know, bring it up to my mind. And right now, since I'm, I'm actually going through my storage and uh, to opening a lot of the boxes I've never had, I might come across a lot of that stuff. Um, mm. I think the album you just sent away for, I'm, I'm almost positive I have that because yeah. the one I have, they used to run full page ads yep. on the karate. So that's yep. the one I have. And it shows like a guy, I guess, in the bottom by the coupon kicking or something like that. It says karate around the top uh, and it shows a record that I do have that. Um, don't ask me when I got it. I didn't get it as a kid. That's for sure. I got it later. But, uh, another thing I wanted to say is, uh, and Joe kind of, it's funny when you're saying the seven foot ghost, cause I don't know if you got aware of this, but I did do this recently, which is, and this is really exciting. I took uh, an original, uh, Johnson Smith ghost, the Johnson Smith ghost that I have, that I, I do have, uh, signed copies. And what I did is with the Johnson Smith Ghost is I also took one of the original ones that I sell in the envelope, the seven foot monster ghost, and I had it embedded and signed inside the big frame that I recently did about the hold that ghost from Abbott and Costello. Mm -hmm. So I accidentally, when I was moving the frame in the storage, I, uh, I perforated the back of it accidentally, you know, the, the paper they put in back. So I was like, oh my gosh, I just finished paying. 300 some dollars for this frame. How can I do that? So I call Hobby Lobby, took it back there. But this time it came to my mind. I said, why don't I put 
two signed ghost copies in there like a time capsule and have it sealed permanently in there, which I did. And apparently that's where it is now. The two ghosts are in and they actually put in the back just instead of putting paper alone, they put the cardboard, you know, the uh, what do you call it? The foam boards. So it's got a mm -hmm. foam board, then paper. So inside that uh, frame with the original hold that ghost poster, there are two seven foot Frank, um, seven foot ghosts embedded into there. So I thought that was a cool idea, you know. Mm -hmm. But anyway, go ahead, Joe. Bring up very, <laughs> very interesting. <laughs> so there you go, Jason. Anytime you need mail order, go to go to Eddie. He probably got three or four of you know the same thing in the store. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, it's it's funny. My collection is fits in like one of those banker boxes. But I mean, if Eddie's collection is so huge to lay hands on any one given thing. Is I, I, it's like I don't think it works that way. <laughs> there's no central index for Eddie's collection, I don't think. No, there's it's no central index. It's just a bunch of <laughs> things all over the place. And what I decided to do, I did a, rent a five feet wide by ten feet deep storage unit. And what I'm going to do with this storage unit in particularly is I'm going to take it, I'm going to fill it with glass display cases, and I'm going to start opening a lot of the original stuff. And one of the things that I'm going to put in that collection is like Chuck's entire magic collection I own. Mm -hmm. I'm going to start unboxing that and putting it there. So it's it's going to be really, really cool and fun, you know. So the only thing I could say to that is uh, as days go by, what's good about it, though, is that I think uh, Dr. Fob or Saab, Dr. Saab is scheduled to come up here in the next two to three weeks. And then maybe just maybe we could start rummaging through it. And I'll probably film it as he opens the boxes. I think that would be a really cool thing to do. I mm. could probably do one or two filmings in one day and then air it. But uh, he's going to be opening boxes and finding things. And I think he's really up to that because he's been asking me for a while. And then he starts salivating on the way. <laughs> so uh, I think I'm going to let him do that. I said, why don't I film you when you open the boxes? He goes, I think that would be a great idea. We could do mm. that. So uh, look yeah. forward to that in the near future. It's like that story. What's that show on TV with the storage lockers where they, they storage, the storage wars? Storage wars, yeah. You know, storage wars in the beginning, I used to love that. I used to watch that show with my wife almost every single week. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, they started like putting things into the unit so that you would, you know, you know what I'm saying? Find it. And oh, it they were. Threw me off. Yeah, because what a coincidence. Every time they get a locker, they're going to find a treasure. That would be like Joe getting a number one Superman in every each unit he buys. Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Well, I, I tell you what, I'd like to see, you know, one of those times somebody goes into one of those and they're rummaging through and finds a uh, an action comics number one. That well, would be a, a cool find. Well, Joe, didn't you hear about the recent find? I think I, I don't know if I sent it to you concerning the guy whose father. Apparently the father was a little eccentric, a little weird. And he used to pack his house back in the 90s uh, or mid-2000s, I think, with comic books and comic books. And the wife was so overwhelmed with it that she actually filed for divorce. And then the lawyer said to her, don't you want to take any of his collection just in case? She goes, listen, I want to burn him, put him in a dumpster. She goes, I want no part of it. Guess what? The guy dies. His son had never really talked with him. They were kind of like, you know, they didn't get along that well. And apparently when he dies, the son gets the whole collection and finds not one, but two number one Supermans. Now, what I mean is not the action comic, the actual number one Superman, which came out later, whatever. And, you know, the action number 15, I think he had one of those. I'm not sure. But they each were appraised because of the condition they were in. They were each appraised of over $3 million. And the funny thing is he's got two number one Batmans, two number one Supermans. And in fact, he he made an entire garage area. He put those steel bolt doors like they use in Fort Knox. And he, he put everything there. He's got over 100,000 comic books. And the lady divorced the guy and she wanted nothing to do with this collection. Isn't that crazy? So that's, that's what I, I mean. Mm -hmm. You can see that on the internet. It just recently happened. In fact, they're actually right now trying to create a movie based on the guy's uh, father's story. Uh, oh, right really? Now. Where'd yeah. that happen at? I'm not sure, but if you look up the guy who found a collection of comics, his father owned, just put Google it. You'll see the information. If not, let me look through it, and I'll I'll email you the uh, the link to it because I know they were trying to get funding, 
uh, they're creating an independent film on it. And it's really, really fascinating. Oh, what's fascinating is the amount of, of money this guy has found in his father's rare collection of comic books. In fact, they, they're saying that the copies he's got of Superman number one are right now the best copies ever found to date. That's how good uh, the books were kept in, in what shape, you know? I'm trying and, to see if I could find anything. Uh... Find it there. It, it just recent. I'm, I'm talking about just a few weeks ago, months ago. I saw it like a month or two ago. I think I sent you the link. I wasn't sure. But, um, you know. I, I, I found the article, but everywhere I go to to try to pull it up, they uh, um, they want you to subscribe to the the thing. It, it's something, it looks like it happened up in Michigan. Yeah, something like that. It, it's reason. But what I, one thing I was going to tell you also is, other than that, is, um, you know, I want to get, uh, Jason, I want to get your opinion on this, because I was asking Joe, but, you know, we, we left it. We said, let's discuss this better at the forum. But here's my, here's my take on this. I watch Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein in 4K, where my son just actually downloaded it off Apple TV. He paid like $14 or whatever, and I was over his birthday two days ago. Happy birthday, Anthony, again. And uh, what I did, though, is that we watched Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein in 4K. And you know what? It, if you, so The best way to describe this is when you see something in 4K, that you're used to watching in the old screen where it's mm. like, two, you know, just two dimensional, not three. Like the an Atari K game with one pixel. Right. The, but, but the 4K can actually make it look three dimensional. And it actually gave the, the images kind of like when you see Barnabas Collins and Dark Shadows, where it looks like, let's say right now you went to your kitchen and you were filming in your kitchen uh, with somebody, let's say your sister or brother's filming you. It looks too realistic. And for some reason, believe it or not, Abbott and Costello felt very awkward. And the awkwardness that I'm talking about is mm. that it looked like so real yep. that it, it failed to. Like, I don't know. I, there was something back of me that really didn't make it look like I was watching Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. It was kind of like awkward, you know. Um, I've been used to more like the two. The, I, I think it looks better in, in the regular DVD uh, mm -hmm. format than when you see it with such clarity. In fact, Costello, where he's sitting in the bench with the uh, woman that she wants to, him to look into her eyes, whatever, in the bass gray bowl, you can actually see in Costello's lip, a lower lip, like a, a mold or something he had or a cut. And I'm like, okay, okay, you know. <laughs> and then again, you know what I was thinking? You know, there's a part where they take Costello and throw him up against, uh, uh, you know, when, uh, what's his name, Mr. McDougal finds him and he takes him and he throws him up against the wall. And then uh, Abbott says to him, why don't you try that again? Uh, you know, I'm going to have you arrested for whatever battery. And he goes, okay. Uh, then he tells the guy with, a, you know, dressed as a knight, come over. And he throws Costello again. The guy, you know, his eyes get covered. And he goes, I didn't see a thing, you know. I was wondering if he actually got hurt in the, while doing the movie. And that uh -huh. part, his lip was like that. But the whole thing is, though, that I, my, my perception of it was not that great. I want to hear your guy's opinion on this. You know, see what you and Joe can, can tell me about it. Well, the whole, you know, I, I remember the whole Blu-ray, HD, DVD, and, you know, I guess the wars of early 2000. But just to, you know, a real quick touch up on that is that Blu-ray started around in October of 2000. And 2002 was when... HD DVD came out. So if you were in what, like a Best Buy or a, any type of DVD store at the time, you seen DVDs, you seen Blu-rays, and you seen HD DVDs. I think they had like the red label on it. So there was huge DVD wars at the time because this was the the next technology for. Um, for movies, you know, in uh, remastered in a high definition and really HD and HD DVDs and Blu-rays kind of almost use the same um, blue disc format. They're, they're just a little bit different because different companies. But it was real big at the time because, you know, people were were used to VHS. They were used to these low quality DVDs. You had a lot of 
a lot of these smaller companies on the internet that were popping up like alpha they were just they were pumping out dvds from old copies of vhs or 16 millimeter or whatever so the quality wasn't there so a lot of people really were looking for a good quality uh dvd a good quality they wanted to see their movies in high definition and it was, you know, the next big thing, like every technology. Now we have 4K, 8K, 100K, whatever the heck's out now. You know, it's always something new. But in the early 2000s, it was Blu-ray versus HD DVD. It, it was the big thing. And, you know, yep. were both of them going to stay in? Were, was one of them going to win? Were, was there going to be somebody that came out of the shadows and, you know, toppled both of them? You know, nobody knew. And you didn't really know what to pick because you know, you would go to Best Buy and ask them, Hey, what's the best one? And they would just tell you, you know, some kind of cheap answer. Well, some people say Blu-ray is better. Some people say HD DVD is better. And you just have to see for yourself. Well, and that's what a lot of people did. They seen for themselves, and they they spoke with their money and they, they continued to buy, you know, Blu-ray, over HD DVD. So it was by about 2007, um, the DVD wars were pretty much over. You know, Blu-ray had, had won by 2008. HD DVD movies were, they stopped being made early 2008. So, you know, the, the Blu-ray DVD won it out. It won the DVD wars of the, uh, <laughs> the early to mid 2000s. But now, you know, a couple of years ago, you have, 4k come out and now you have dvds that you could get the regular dvd the with the blue and 4k version and online you know online through their their hat in the ring but it really mm -hmm. wasn't much to compete with blu-ray or, or 4k uh because 4k was blowing stuff out, out of the, the water with their quality uh oh spaceships there eddie <laughs> spaceship earth spaceship earth <laughs> So with the 4K, though, the only, you, you know, Blu-ray is great. You know, you, you get a real crisp, you know, I think you get a real crisp uh, uh, video there. My issue with 4K and higher is that it, it no longer looks like a movie. It looks more like you're, you're standing there with your camera and you just, you know, recorded somebody. It looks too real. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when it's on the TV, in my opinion, and a few other people I've talked to, it just, it looks too real. It doesn't look like a movie anymore. It doesn't look like fantasy or make-believe. It's, it looks like something different. And, you know, we go back to a lot of these old movies, like Eddie was talking about, and they get remastered for Blu-ray, for 4K, for digital, all this other stuff. And it really kind of takes away from the charm of the, the movies, because now you start seeing... Um, a lot of the strings being used to, to hold up the props mm -hmm. and a lot of the cheap special effects that they used at the time that was yeah. hidden. Stuntman switches. Right, yeah, stuntman switches. A lot of stuff that was hidden by the low definition yep. has now come to light with the high definition. It pulls and you right out of the movie. Yeah, it just, it it, it kind of really ruins it. And it, it did for me a little bit a couple of years ago when, and I had talked to Eddie about this when I was watching Lost in Space. You know, it was on a, a digital remastered DVD set, which sounds fantastic. And all you're like, man, I'm going to get a great picture quality and all that. And the picture quality was great, but you could see every little special effect detail in there that they did. Every string, every um, every stuntman chain, every cardboard background, every every cardboard background, every zipper on the monster's uniform. Yeah. You know, the the tennis shoes that the the monster was wearing and it just, it really kind of takes you out of that mood, you know, because sometimes you could really be into a movie, but then you start noticing these little special effect things and, and it really takes you out. And it's a lot of these movies are made to be watched in a lower definition. Yeah. You know, Blu ray is great for some of them. You want to watch them in Blu ray just to, you know, see the crispness of it because, you know, we, we're in a technologically advanced society. We want to keep seeing the next big thing, the better thing. And, and that's fine. You know, you want to see Dracula 1931 in Blu-ray or 4K, knock yourself out. But you're not going to enjoy it as much as you would with just, you know, a regular definition DVD. Yeah. Uh, 
So that's just kind of my quick take on it. Jason, what do you think about the whole whole situation with like kind of digital HD 4K, all this this nonsense that we're we're bombarded with. Yeah, I mean it makes sense on on modern movies, I guess, but for the older ones, it it definitely allows you to see the cracks, and and you don't want to see cracks. You you want to have it play like music where it's kind of seamless and and takes you along. I find. Um, what was I watching? The um, there's somebody on YouTube who's been resampling. Um, some Ray Harryhausen scenes, you know, the stop animation, Jason and the Argonauts and right uh, stuff like that. And speeding up the frame rate on those so that the motion looks smoother. I did uh, see that. Yes. And and that I find, I guess, in the way that Eddie says it looks disturbing. I find those look disturbing as well. They don't, it doesn't, doesn't play right somehow. I don't know if that's because I'm just used to seeing the choppy motion or, it's almost like an uncanny valley kind of thing. It doesn't it doesn't read right to me. But you know, and I thought the same way. I watched it because they were doing like kind of like a uh, they would show you the old version and then mm. the new version. And I'm watching that, and I said, "This is made for th- this is made for the newer generation." That that's what the the speeding up is because I could watch that, and I. You know, I look at I like I kind of like the choppiness of it because I I could appreciate the work that went behind you know what these guys what yep. these special effects people did to make that happen, and that's how I remember watching the movies with a choppy. Does it look better with it, you know, smoothed out? Well, I kind of I I guess you know it kind of looks like maybe more realistic or more smooth, but I want you know I, I don't want to be you know, where it's a hyper realistic, like a four, four K. Mm-hmm. I, I want to be in the movie, how it was made at that time. And it was made choppy because these guys spent hundreds of hours doing stop motion. And that's the best that they had at that time. Now, okay. You want to make a, a new movie that's stop motion and use the smoother. Yeah. If you want your quality, fine, go do that, but leave the classics alone. Yeah. You want to go do an up- update on a movie, go make a, a new movie and make it better, but don't, don't mess with the uh, the classic, I guess. It's not, yeah, it's not I, a win. Just, it's not a. Yeah, to me, I I, I don't like that. Maybe I, I could see newer generations being turned off by that. You know, the special effects at that time, and maybe you know would watch it if it was more sped up and looked a little bit more smoother. Because, I mean, look at a lot of these newer generations that, of younger kids, and even a lot of people that are movie buffs all they want is special effects anymore and you know, to heck with the storyline. And I, that's kind of like where the whole Marvel universe online universe or cinematic universe went. It's, it's funny. Cause if, if, if I look, you know, look at the two, um, if you look at uh, black Panther, when black Panther showed up in, was it civil war? Yeah. Civil that was, war. It was a stunt man. It was a stunt man in the, in the outfit. And it just reads right. When, when the fights happen with stunt men, and then in Black Panther, the final fight scene in Black Panther, where it's just two mannequins fighting each other, it was like, why Why did you even spend the time on this thing? I don't care about either of those guys. I can tell right. they're they're just animations. Yeah, no- exactly. That, but you know what? That's kind of what people want anymore. They want more well, special effects. And I, talk to, I don't I talk know if to- they want it I don't, or if it's just easier and cheaper. I don't know. I, th- I think people want... I mean, look, uh, what... What the Netflix Daredevil series? Have you seen that? Um, series? Oh yeah, that was fantastic. Yeah, the fights because you actually felt for the guy. He actually take took injuries, and they he kept the injuries through the whole series, which was nice to see. And he fought differently because he was injured and stuff like that. And I was thinking the other day about like Captain America. That guy gets fired through a cement wall. He gets up. He's not even dusty. <laughs> what? Who cares about what's happening to these people if they can't take damage? If they can't? Uh, if they can't get hurt? Right, but I think there's a lot of people out there that don't care about the stories, and they just want special effects and explosions. And I think that the people that are actually supporting these movies and paying for it mm-hmm. have showed that they don't want that over the yeah. years. In a big, po- I think we could see that a lot in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and I think a lot in the Transformers movies. That that came out. I think they did four or five of them, but mm-hmm. 
the storylines were so bad and they thought, <laughs> well, if we throw in special effects and a bunch of explosions, yeah. people will like it. Well, they didn't. They they were horribly reviewed. They weren't making any money because the stories were garbage. But there was a lot of special effects and you know nobody wanted to see them. Yeah. Well, they don't have to make a huge amount of money. They just have to make enough money. Just make know? enough. That's exactly. the sad thing about I mean, a lot of the, the DC movies is they made them enough money to not teach them a lesson on what they were making, I think. They made enough to break and maybe make a little bit more so it was a success and nobody had to change anything. Oh, yeah, that's like the first, uh, what was that um, Justice League movie? Yep. Oh, the special effects were so horrible out oh. there. You had people on YouTube that were amateurs showing how they made better special effects and better characters than what the people you know at yep. DC were doing. Yeah. How is that possible? You're paying millions of dollars, you know, for these special effects crews and you have hundreds of people that yep. usually work on them, but you have one person yep. sitting in his mom's basement behind a computer is doing a better job. Hire yep. that guy. I read an article on that. The um the special effects, how they, they firm them out to companies. And then they'll want changes. And the, of course, they're doing it to the lowest bidder as almost like a, a third party service. And they they hammer these companies. Sometimes the companies will do the do the movies and not make enough money to stay in business because they get so hammered with changes and the director makes a change. And we have to change the story for this or that. And then we have, and sometimes the, the re shots are built into the contract costs and sometimes they're not. So it's, the special effects houses aren't making mint off these things. They're not doing yeah. them in house, I guess, anymore, which is the problem. Right. You know, and that's why I, I, I tend to, to gravitate more towards classic movies because the, the storylines are there for what they had at the time. Their special effects were fantastic. It was all handmade, nothing computer. You know, when you look at the special effects that went behind like the Invisible Man, the original mm -hmm. one with Claude Rains, it's unbelievable. It's like, who the heck thinks of this stuff? Yeah, at the so time the, the the ingenuity they had to come up with to make things make things show up on screen in those days eddie what's your opinion on all this i know you've got a big one waiting <laughs> no it's basically what i'm saying it and you know i was thinking in my mind what the movie that's called the dark old house or the old dark house i didn't mm -hmm. realize they had made two versions they made the 1932 one i think with boris Karloff in it and then they had a 1963 by William Castle. But again, let's be honest, who knows what William Castle did? I mean, every single film that William Castle did, I uh, was telling Joe, they kind of all stink, you know? <laughs> but uh, yeah, yes, I was wondering what the house. original, uh, the, the, the old dark house, like I said, if you see the William Castle 1963 version, it's horrible, horrible. And I downloaded an app called uh, Chiller Theater. Uh, from I, I guess, and, and the guy there who looks like an old uh, Ozzy Osbourne, whatever. I gotta be honest with you, it's horrible. The app sucks. The whole pre premises of the channel thing sucks. But anyway, the thing I was gonna say is with the old dark house, I was wondering what it would look like in 4K, the original one with Boris Karloff. But other than that, to be honest with you. My take is that I think, like Joe says, 100%, it makes him look too realistic. Yep. Like I said, I think still, and I was not too happy with it. I was actually like, wow, man, there, you know, this could be a better film. Or it, it was good. I just like the old fashioned uh, 2D better than the new uh, high resolution 4K, you know? Yeah, these, these aren't nature documentaries. They don't benefit from the high, you don't get more out of it because you can see Abbott's uh, mole. Really. Yeah, no, it wasn't Abbott. I think Costello, I think, like I said, I think he broke his lip or something because you could definitely see something in his lower lip. Wait. Joe, how do you, oh, oh, you, Jason, because you're the computer guy, how in the world are they able to take a film that has very little uh, material on it, very little anything on it, and all of a sudden create where you could see the strings if it doesn't show in the original, um, in the original thing, you know? Like, how are they able to do that by doing 4K? You have any idea? Well, if they went back to the masters to do their transfers. Well, yeah, but when you're saying back to the masters, what exactly were the masters? Uh, how many of them actually have still masters left? You know, I mean, mm -hmm. when, you know, just like when they recolorize a movie, how exactly do they do it? I mean, how it's crazy, you know? Yeah, it's, it's funny. It's yeah, I, color, I hadn't thought about colorization in a few years, man. That, it is kind of like colorization all over again, really. Yeah, it, 
I'm not a fan of, uh, uh, and I've said it before on this, I'm not a fan of colorization. I think it's a, I, I think colorization works in historical documentaries. Um, and, and I've always said, when you're dealing with history, history, you know, especially like real quick going off on a tangent here, <laughs> when you're reading history books, you shouldn't, you shouldn't visualize what is there. You know, if I'm describing a house to you from the 1800s and I'm, I'm describing it, you shouldn't have to imagine it because I could describe something to a hundred people and all hundred people will have a different idea of what this house looks like in their mind. There should be a photo with it to show what this house looks like because history is facts and it's not just, it's not your imagination. Mm -hmm. So, Going back to the colorization in movies, I, I'm not a fan of it in movies because that's not how they intended to, to make it. However, docu like history, historical documentaries, yes, I, I believe that, you know if you could color those, it should be fine. Because like if you're watching a war documentary, you should be able to see what color the uniforms and the weapons were. It, that yeah, that would be, be facts. Not... Yeah, it shouldn't be left to imagination because it's it's facts. But if you're you know, watching 1931 Frankenstein and it's in color, it doesn't really need to be in color because it, you're, you, it's your imagination. It's a it's a fictional story. It's a fictional movie. And your imagination could run wild with it. If you want to think Frankenstein is, you know, a purple monster, it, it doesn't really matter because, you know, it is what it is. Mm, well, and, um, and you're also missing how the director or the or the the artist involved in it created it because they created it for black and white exactly. at a certain resolution they made choices based on that this is going to be black and white this is going to be low res so we can do this we can get away with this we can hide that we can make these choices on the colors that we put the people in like the what's the uh, the Les Paul guitar where it's a light green almost because that showed up better on black and white television yeah, that's why they did, you know, what that's why they made Frankenstein's monster green in the 1931 movie. It's it, it showed up better on uh on film. I can't remember the color they were going to go before before that, but they found green worked better. Mm. And that's the only reason. There's no historical fact or anything about it. It's you know, what worked better for the time. And like you said, Jason, that that's how they they made the movie to be in black and white, so that's yep. how it it should be watched. Yeah. It's um. I was just thinking. I've been watching a few classic Star Trek episodes with the kids, and they're on Netflix. And I put them on, and I mean, the, they've been they've been HD eyes somehow. And you can see Kirk and not Kirk. You can see the stuntman getting getting subbed in. But oh yeah. <laughs> the part that really bugs me on those is they reshot. It looks like they reshot the the intro scenes where you see the the Enterprise cruising around a planet. Oh, and did they really? I don't know why they bothered because I mean, you know, you're watching Star Trek from the 1960s. It doesn't need to look like it was made yesterday, last year. Or did they do it on computer or something? Yeah, it looks like it's totally digital? smooth. It looks totally oh. perfect, but it, it's totally out of context for a 1960s science fiction uh, series. I, I love watching those old stories, especially when they get like thrown into a rock for you know a huge <laughs> boulder or something. You could see the boulder kind of shake a little bit, or it comes up off the ground. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> because it's paper mache or whatever they use you know <laughs> mm -hmm. but you know you're that's how you're and you expect that with that because it was a low budget sci-fi show at the time and it, it to me it really doesn't take anything out of the show because nope. it, it is a very campy it is a it is campy in a way but it's you know a, a very I guess serious science fiction in a way too. So it just it kind of works with it. You know, like when they're fighting the uh oh god, what are those things that look like little toupees that they uh Oh the tribbles? The tribbles, yeah. I, I mean very funny, you know, very campy, but you expect it for that time. Or like you said, the stuntmen going in and out. It's just yeah. it's expected for that time and they worked with what they had and it doesn't take it doesn't take you know anything out of it mm -hmm. because that's how that's how you would originally watched it you know in the sixties if you were sitting in front of your TV let and me, you're watching it for the first let time. Me, let me ask you a question. The say for example, didn't the original Star Trek have the Enterprise going around the planet though? 
when it started. I, I could almost swear that that's the way it used to be, though, Jason. Mm-hmm. No, it, it it did. I just it looks like they reshot those. Oh, those I see scenes. what you're saying. That they reshot. They the replaced scene. them with more yeah. modern versions of them. Yeah, that that's the whole deal behind that. I I mean, I was kind of I'm watching, like I said, Abbott and Costello, and I was left like, wait a minute, man. This looks too realistic. I, I kind of didn't really like that. And, and I didn't know what to do or say because I was trying to tell my, you know, my, my son's brother-in-law what a great film it was, you know. And he liked it and everything. But I wish they would have seen it in 2D. If I would have known that, I would have told my son, watch it instead of 4K. Watch it on, um, you know, on the YouTube channel. It wouldn't have been the 4K version, you know. Mm-hmm. Well, if they packaged the original with the 4K, I suppose it would be better. At least then you're not losing losing that choice. But Basically, I guess they're trying yeah. to sell to new new buyers, and new buyers yeah, are going to want but, new buyers are know, attracted by the 4K, I suppose. But you you see, if you know, again, Dark Shadows. One of the things I hated about Dark Shadows, even though it was shot in the 70s, is because it looks too realistic. I tell my wife, it feels like somebody was in your kitchen. I mean, doing this and Barnabas Collins. It just doesn't have any background noise. It has nothing, in my opinion. It's I don't like Dark Shadows for that main reason. I you don't like the uh, you know the, dark the original Dark Shadows. I hate it because of the reason it looks too realistic. It it lacks the uh, Abbott and Costello look, the Three Stooges look, the I Love Lucy show look. You know, it what just was that looks shot like, on was it shot on uh, video cassette or I, I don't know, but it, it looks no. I don't know if it was shot on video cassette because back in the seventies they didn't have video cassette, but. Whatever they shot the original Dark Shadows in, it doesn't make Dark Shadows look like a good TV show. Well, they well it was ran as a as a soap opera, and they they were doing it live. You know, every episode of Dark Shadows was live. So if there was a mess up or anything, it, you know, that that's just how it how it happened. You know, with them and, and watching Dark Shadows, and I kind of. It it really doesn't bother me. Sometimes you could see the boom mic coming down, or a crew member's you know shadow go you know going across the floor. But you know that's how they did it at the time. It, it was it was a soap opera. It was done live. There was mess ups there. You know it, it just is what it is. I, I don't think I'd want to see a, a Blu-ray Dark Shadows, <laughs> something like that, or a 4K. I think would be be worse. But yeah, I I kind of get what Eddie's. Eddie's saying where it almost looks kind of too real. That never never took any, for me, that never took anything uh, away from it because I understood, you know, how they were, you know, what their intention was there and they had to do it live and they had to get it done and they had a low budget and, you know, that was out, you know, pump out that episode for the day. So, you know, talking about low budget, I don't know why, why they did some films and I don't know why they didn't do classics like Dracula or Frankenstein in color. I mean, I don't believe they've been recolorized or anything, but they did do the House on Haunted Hill. They did the Bat. They did a few of the films of Vincent Price. And here's the thing about it: the kicker, it actually costs between three and five thousand dollars to colorize a film, because they have to do actually each individual film cell. So that's it's crazy. It's crazy to get your money back on that if you do it. You have to sell quite a few of them, you know. I can I have, imagine in, in a few years that won't be the yeah. case with with the AI. Um, no, it, it won't be nowadays. Right. Well, you know, there was a couple of years ago somebody on on YouTube did Dracula 1931 in color, and some parts of it look okay, but it's definitely a movie. It takes away a, a lot from the movie, a lot of the atmosphere from the movie. And especially Lugosi's makeup that he wore. He wore that. They did that makeup for the black and white mm-hmm. in color. It just it doesn't look right. It looks like caked on makeup, you know, on him. It just a lot of the the dark atmosphere and everything of the castle and inside the castle. It just it doesn't look right with color. Oh, hey, have, have you guys seen the uh, the new Renfield movie? Speaking of Dracula, movie? no, I haven't. No, I haven't. I, I have not in. I, I'm still 50 50 if I want to see it. It looks, I don't know, it looks kind of cool, but I, I don't know. What do you guys think about it? What's your opinions? Some, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you the opinion. One of my guys in work saw it and he said, Oh, you know, I don't know what to say. I, he told me it sucked. <laughs> At the same time, he said, You might like it, but there's too much CGI. Oh. And I didn't. So, my opinion on it is just, I'm not really interested in watching it. 
But I got to be honest with you, though. It's, it's like you said, sometimes, and even the fact when I told you about color, so if you watch the House on Haunted Hill in color or you watch the black and white, you know, you can either like either or. But I got to tell you, though, it's I, I'm still like Joe. I'm really kind of stuck in that old type of format thing. And I hate all this do stuff they're doing to it. I thought it was going to be better, but in reality, I really don't know what to say anymore. What do you think, Jason? What's your opinion on it? Oh, Renfield? Yeah. And I haven't seen either. I, I, I wish the movie was all Nicolas Cage, really, because I think that would have been great. But I love I love a goofy horror movie, and I think you would have been over the top through the whole thing. But um, it, it, it's funny to, to see, like, because I love superhero movies, or I love superheroes, and I love horror. And to think that in, like, 2023, they're putting out superhero movies and horror, and I have no interest at all in seeing them. Something's gone it's either me or the movies. I don't know which which has gone off the rails. Well, I'll tell you what. He told me. I'm sorry, Joe. Uh, well, I was going to say they told me Nicolas Cage is not in the movie that much. Only that's a few pro- minutes. That's a problem. So, yeah, so that's a big problem right there. Yeah. Now, there is one movie I am excited about, and I think it it's going to be done well from the trailer. It looks like it's done well, and that's The Last Voyage of the Demeter. Have you guys seen the, oh, no, the trailer for this? So it comes out August 11th, and it is it's based on the single chapter of the captain's log from the you know the Bram Stoker's novel about you know Dracula being on the the boat the Demeter, and I tell you what the the movie is yeah. it's done very seriously. Mm-hmm. It seems like it's done um, how it would be in the the book, and it's very dark. And it just it looks it looks very creepy. I mean, the the Dracula in it, he's not like the um because on the boat, you know, he wasn't, you know, dressed up to the nines and looking mm. good. He was a monster on the boat. And he he looks like that in this movie too. the quick glimpses you see of him. He looks like that, like that beast, that monster. Yeah. And it looks, you know, everybody on there is dying and they're getting afraid. And it's just. It looks really cool. I'm, I'm, this is one I'm I'm actually excited about. Renfield, I, I'm not I'm not too sure yet. I I I just don't know. You know, I, I, sometimes I'm a fan of Nicolas Cage. Sometimes it's it's too much. But the last voyage of the Demeter, I, I'd advise you guys recommend check out the trailer because it's absolutely it's creepy mm-hmm. this is a movie that you watch with all the lights off at, at night so i may even go see this in the theater because it just looks really cool so no that's a good setup with the uh because it's kind of like a locked room with a monster in it you're you're on the boat yeah yeah basically and... yeah where are you gonna go you're on the boat you know you have what, what are you gonna do there's nothing and i'm telling you when you see the when you see the monster on there when you see dracula it looks like how you would picture him a, as the, you know, the the monster. So it's a vicious, really cool. I think they did a good job on it. It's a um, I don't think it's in. I'm trying to look. I don't think it's an American. Uh, no, it's un- it universal. Right um, oh, is it universal or is it Universal International? Amblin, DreamWorks, it's New Republic, it's... Phoenix. It's because they do have some some names that I cannot pronounce. <laughs> oh yeah, the director is Andre Ovaldal or something like that. Yeah, um, something. So it looks like they were uh, filmed they were in Berlin to... at Ulta. Yeah, they have. Yeah, who's the production mm-hmm. company? Uh, DreamWorks, Ambien, New Republic, Phoenix Pictures, distributed by Universal. Uh, so let's see here. So yeah, I don't know. Maybe it's you know they have a lot of. Uh, international people attached to it. Hey, which is which is cool because it looks uh, it looks really cool. And I tell you, the last several movies I've watched have been all uh, international movies, and they've been fantastic. So you know, they usually don't have none of this social or political garbage into them. It's just a mm. straight good movie with a good story, and that's kind of how this looks. Um, so I'm kind of interested because I mean, the chapter was short on you know, the captain's log from the Demeter. So I'm wondering how they're going to stretch this out here, but it looks like they're going to kind of stay true to the book and true to the character. Cause I, I would be really upset if, you know, somehow there was a defeat of Dracula on the boat because 
you know, yeah, because the, the boat pulled into port and there was no one alive. So. Right. Yeah, the last person was tied to the the um, what's it called? The uh, what do you call the steering wheel or whatever? Dead. Yeah. So I mean, even the poster. I mean, look at the poster on uh, thing. It it looks really cool. It's it's the boat with the Dracula monster standing at at the front of it. It's uh huh. He's looking Nosferatuish there. It, yeah, exactly. It, it looks like a an updated meaner version of Nosferatu, which is really cool, which, yeah, it, you know, it, it kind of gives it that old, uh, that old feel from Nosferatu, like a German, um, mm -hmm. expressionist, film, yeah. you know, to it. Yeah. Noir expressionist. Yeah. So it, I, I'm excited about this. So we'll, we'll Joe, see. I, we'll definitely I, be I talking know. about it. I thought it was Nosferatu when I saw it. It looks very scary. This is my take on the film. It's probably, in the same level as Ghost Ship. I think, well, you know, Ghost Ship was a great film and everything. The only problem is the ending could have been better. And, and you know, I've, I've lately seen that when you have a film that's extremely, really exciting and looks great, the ending is always like, eh, can it be better? Well, we know the, we know the ending on this. I, I mean, agree. we know the ending on this movie. Well, mm. I'm not too familiar. It's like a, like a Columbo. Yeah, I mean, if you read the if if you read the the book or or watch any of the Dracula movies, we know the ending for this movie. All all this is going to do is it's going to fill in the blanks that weren't in other movies or weren't in the story because the story chapter was fairly quick on this. So this is just going to drag out that chapter a little bit more. But will it drag it out too much? you know, and, and overplay it, or will it be just perfect? You know, I don't know. And I haven't seen a uh, a runtime for the movie yet either. So it'll be yeah, interesting so. to, it'll be interesting to see. I mean, we know the beginning, we know the ending, you know, but we don't know these little gap fillers in the middle. What? Acted to the deaths. When is it coming? What's that, Eddie? When is it coming out? Is it towards the summertime? Uh, August 11th. Yeah, August 11th. And there is no runtime yet that I could find on, on Wikipedia or IMDb. So I'm hoping it's not, you know, you know, just too long. An hour and a half to probably hour 45 minutes would be perfect for the film. But I guess we'll see. Got a really cool poster. I kind of want that poster. <laughs> mm. Yeah, it's pretty ominous. Yeah. Yeah. You know yeah, I mean, um, it just like that poster to me. I look at it and it just it signifies the victory of Dracula on that boat. Yeah, he's he's riding into shore, really. Uh, it, or exactly. someone is someone hiding out with the land? No, that's him. Okay. No, I, are you talking about under the boat? Yeah, that's yeah. that's the part of the uh, the ship. It's the, just the prow. Okay. Yeah, but yeah, it looks really cool. Like he's he's riding into shore, like ready to to take it over wherever he's going. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's mm -hmm. it's cool. It, it shouldn't be called. It should be called the revenge of. Yeah, <laughs> I, yeah. He's just he, he's like a. Good, good. He, he's like a Nosferatu with wings. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the same face. They actually just copied the whole thing right out of the movie. I think. I mean, well, I think in terms of this of vampire scariness, I think Nosferatu is probably the scariest looking. When I think what was that Stephen King series that was on television back in the seventies? Oh, Salem's Lot. When he pops yeah, up in that this, coffin. You know what? This this looks more like the vampire from Salem's Lot, like the Nosferatu, I think, because the Salem's Lot had the real big ears. And all that. He looks like that too. Maybe they did a mixture of Salem's Lot vampire and Nosferatu for this. Mm -hmm. A little, I, a little I, Morbius I still mixed like in. the Bella Lugosi. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I like Bella Lugosi. Hey, guys. We're, we're, I hate to hop in here, but we're down to about a minute, so we are going to wrap things up here. Everybody out there in podcast land, once again, as always, every week, we are here for you, House of the Unusual. Thank you for joining us on whatever platform that you are subscribed to. Hopefully, you're subscribed to us. If not, you better subscribe to us. Give us a good review, please. Definitely helps us out with all the algorithms and all that. Also, if you're a YouTube person, we're on YouTube. Just type in House of the Unusual. You'll find Eddie and Chuck are always doing some great videos on there. Uh, subscribe to it. Uh, 
like the videos, hit the notification bell, all that good stuff that you do with YouTube. You know how you know what to do. I don't have to explain it. Also, we have houseoftheunusual.com. It's a free forum site. There's all the links to all of our uh, podcasts, to the YouTube, to Etsy, to eBay. It's all that good stuff. So it's, it's your one-stop shop, and it's, it's our flagship site. But the forum is really great. A lot of cool stuff always going up on, on there. Uh, you can meet a lot of like-minded people. And, hey, join in on the fun because that's what we're all about. So, guys, that's all that we got for this week. We are out of time. So thank you, everybody, for joining us. And good night. Good night. God bless everybody. Bye-bye. Talk to you later. Bye.